let's uh, begin our first uh, group of public comments. And the first speaker is Jerry Curry. Each uh, person is allowed um, five minutes, correct? And we, uh, to be courteous to all of our speakers, because we have a full roster here, I'm going to make sure that everybody keeps on to that. Please be courteous so that others can have an opportunity to give their comments as well. So, Ms. Curry, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it has been 27 years since the CDC was sent to investigate this illness, and yet here we are with no cure, no treatments, no help whatsoever. Naming a severely disabling disease chronic fatigue syndrome is like a sick joke. However, that is the name that the CDC decided to give to a typical outbreak of ME+, myalgic encephalomyelitis, plus the additional evidence of immune abnormalities collected by doctors Cheney and Peterson. We must not let that be forgotten. CFS is the name given to a disease entity of ME+. It is not and has never been a social construct, an illness devoid of evidence of severe pathology or a description of tired people. Chronic fatigue syndrome does not and has never had anything to do with fatigue. The lack of meaningful research on CFS has helped to create an epidemic. The CDC is still claiming that the research program involving their infamous Georgia study, the ones where they got their patients by random telephone surveys, has, according to them, greatly increased knowledge about CFS and has helped the healthcare community develop viable treatments. That is complete hogwash. I suppose that is to be expected from an agency that has spent nearly 30 years trying to frame a severe neuroimmune disease as a psychological defect. They have wasted what little paltry pittance of research money allocated towards this heinous disease on garbage studies, like the ones that claim that childhood trauma and personality disorders are risk factors for CFS. CFS is a term coined in response to a severely debilitating illness with evidence of profound immune abnormalities. Let's try working with the evidence instead of inventing psychological drivel, or at the very least, if you are not going to help us, at least stop lying about us. I developed CFS in 2006. Fatigue was the least of my problems. I was experiencing episodes of being unable to move my arms and legs, days that I was so weak that I had to crawl to the bathroom, <clears throat> head and neck pain that made me feel as if I'd been beaten with a baseball bat, New onset dyslexia, loss of short-term memory, frequent syncope, racing heart rate, seizures, natural killer cell numbers so low that my doctors first thought it was a lab error. I lost my friends, my career, and my independence. We are all aware of the stigma associated with the name chronic fatigue syndrome. The public views us as lazy hypochondriacs thanks to an almost three decades long propaganda campaign by the very people who are supposed to be helping us who instead continue on with their ceaseless efforts to mislead, deceive, and bury the facts. I want to make something very clear. The illness known as CFS, based on an outbreak of ME+, has never been fully investigated by anyone. Not one researcher has examined all the evidence that caused the creation of this syndrome. After nearly 30 years, not a single one. This is a disgrace. A disease that has brought brutal and relentless suffering to now millions of people and yet we have evidence that it has been around since the inception of the syndrome that has never been examined. The reason that I'm able to be here today is because I have been fortunate enough to be able to utilize therapeutic strategies based on evidence that has been ignored for over a quarter century. In Klein Village, survivor Eric Johnson, who served as a prototype for the syndrome, noticed a phenomenon in regards to biotoxins in this disease. He devised a strategy in response to it which enabled him to achieve such an astounding recovery that he is able to climb mountains. Thanks to his work and persistence, there are now quite a few CFS patients who have used his techniques to achieve recovery. We are not cured. However, many of us who were severely disabled are now able to live near normal lives. It's time that researchers start looking at this. Discarding evidence for decades on a horrific, life-destroying disease is negligent. I want to know why no doctors and no researchers are telling patients about this. If it had not been for Mr. Johnson, I would either be dead or still rotting in my bed. So to him, I would like to say this with all of my heart and soul. Thank you for helping me. And to all of you CFS researchers who claim to be unaware of this evidence, I want to say this. You are aware now. 
what are you going to do about it? Thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Jadwiga Lopez Mahano. Can you pr press the button? Okay. Thank you. That's new to me. When our grandsons became ill with FECFS, our lives changed completely. We were both retired when they were born and therefore free to spend a lot of time with them and their parents, even though they lived in Oklahoma and we in Chicago. We visited back and forth explored state parks together, escaped to Acapulco in the winter, and enjoyed vacations in Massachusetts, Michigan, Colorado, and Illinois. We, of course, became very familiar with the Children's Museum in Chicago, as well as enjoyed the Art Institute, the Field Museum, and others, the zoos, and the botanic gardens. There were trips to Europe to visit friends, family, and sites in Italy, and to attend special events in the, with the family in Spain. Our 50th anniversary gift to each other was to be a trip to Greece for all of us. It was all planned, reservations made, when we found out that Matthew was too incapacitated because of MECFS to travel. That was seven years ago. I still have the file of arrangements and itinerary unused. Since MECFS imposed itself on Alexander and Matthew, I see the boys, now young men, only once or twice a year and only in their home. They cannot fly and it is too far and too exhausting for them to travel by car. I no longer get spontaneous phone calls with news about school, swimming meets, new games, etc., because they had to leave school, give up swimming, and because conversation is now so difficult and taxing for them. I know very little about the books they read, the political concerns they have, what they would like to do with their lives because talking is physically painful. There are no more walks, visits to friends, trips to museums. Alexander and Matthew's lives have been shoved into an abyss of MECFS. As their grandmother, I'm deeply concerned with the prolonged lack of serious attention given to MECFS and the lack of serious funding for the ME research by the DHHC agencies. And I'm appalled by this, that this has been going on since before Alexander and Matthew were even born. Things like the inexcusably small amounts of funding for ME research are shameful. It's a shameful, it's shameful that during the average length of illness for a patient with ME, NIH spends only $240 per patient. That's what $6 a year per patient over 40 years works out. Contrast that with the NIH spending on lupus and MS, both of which are similarly disabling businesses but are less prevalent than ME. See attached. Contrast that with NIH spending over the course of the average length of illness for a person with lupus, NIH spends $3,500 per patient. And for MS, NIH spends $9,900 per patient over the course of the average length of illness. See graph. That must change. I have read the joint letter of concern submitted to Secretary Sebelius, Dr. Koch, Dr. Lee, and the CFSAC and signed by 14 organizations and 19 individuals. I too endorse this letter of concern. I want to reinforce points made in that letter. The MECFS strategic plan must be a coordinated and fully funded effort to finally solve MECFS. The ME strategic plan must resolve definitional and classification confusion 
and ensure that research is done using a definition that appropriately de de identifies patients. The ME strategic plan must provide a fair share of research funding focused on biological pathologies, biomarkers, and treatment, and it must remove all barriers to con continuing such studies. The ME strategic plan- You have one more minute. Thank you. The ME strategic plan must ensure appropriate education of the medical community and must significantly improve the CDC's CFS website so that it better describes the disease. The ME strategic plan must accelerate the FDA pipeline for ME treatments. The ME strategic plan must result in easily accessible treatment that helps patients, caregivers, medical professions, professionals, and everyone else improve the quality of patients' lives while decreasing disability and sickness. The ME CFS strategic plan must start now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker will be coming uh, via phone, and so let me make sure I get this right. has asked to be rem to remain anonymous. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is Dr. Lee. I'm calling. Are you the person who wants to talk, get testimony? Yes, I am. Okay. So you have five minutes. Okay. I'm the mother of uh, two teenage daughters whose lives have been turned upside down by a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So much more harm happened to them than I can fit in a five-minute comment, but here goes. We've all heard the myths, ulcers cause, are caused by stress, cold mothers cause autism, bad parenting causes ADHD. MS, or what used to be called hysterical paralysis, is a faker's disease. Except for ulcers, none of these illnesses have a simple germ theory explanation, and yet these myths have thankfully been retired, and patients are treated respectfully, compassionately, and sanely. It's time to do the same for patients who are ill, but diagnosed with the myth that is CFS. In the fall of 2008, my older daughter was diagnosed with a mono-like illness. My younger daughter was diagnosed with viral meningitis. After a proper medical and psychological evaluation, we were referred to a pediatric infectious disease specialist, and we received a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. My daughters were diagnosed right away, and I'm grateful to our pediatricians who've known my daughter since birth. Our problems began when the high school found out that my daughter was diagnosed with CFS. The Peds ID doctor had recommended a gradual return to classes in order to prevent relapses, but the school incorrectly informed me that that couldn't be done. The doctor found out about a 504 plan for me to have her transition back into school. Despite repeated crashes and an increase in symptoms that this caused, the school removed the 504 in June. In September, my daughter attempted the first day of school, optimistic, after a summer, but she collapsed for two days afterward, hardly able to stand. No one had told us about post-exertional, not malaise really, but crash or collapse. I realized that the school employees had a very different impression of this diagnosis than what I saw in my daughters. A search for CFS in children yielded stories about how it may be or is thought to be or some researchers feel that it develops because of depression and other psychiatric reasons. My daughters had all of these other physical symptoms that were not listed like Dr. Rowe was speaking about earlier. And despite the insistence of the school employees, who did not know my daughters, they did not have any depression or school phobias. According to them, CFS is just fatigue, and everyone experiences fatigue. She still needs to go to school. We were coerced into pr pressuring my daughter to ignore her diagnosis and just push her to attend school. My daughter became more exhausted and very discouraged as her f physical condition worsened. At school, the psychologist, social worker, and guidance counselor had started telling my daughters that they were not sick when they saw them. They said they could tell by looking at them. They said they simply did not believe that my daughter was at home, exhausted, sleeping, unable to stand or shower. The school psychologist suggested that I drag her into the car in her pajamas, and he would get her out of the car and into the school building. Scary. By March, the district created a petition requiring my daughter to attend family court diversion. They had claimed that her medically excused absences 
were now truancy. The counselor we met with did her research and found that my daughter had a legitimate illness. Unfortunately, the school didn't listen to her either. Next September, the guidance counselor and social worker again refused to discuss the illness but spoke only of behavior and attendance issues. There was no history of such problems. The guidance counselor asked my daughter when her birthday was so she could determine when they would no longer be responsible for her under compulsory education laws so that my daughter would drop out. She then told me I needed to homeschool my daughters or else child protective services would be called because the district was never going to provide services for my daughters. They claimed that the doctor's letters did not have a valid diagnosis or prognosis. The nurse from the school called the doctor to challenge him to see if he had any proof that he was correct. Later, the district consulting psychiatrist challenged the validity of the diagnosis. She used the CFS pages on the CDC website to question my choice of treatments and then decided that the school should not have to provide any services because I did not have my children in CBT and GET to treat their CFS. Additionally, the district psychiatrist told the family advocate that they were focusing on discrediting me and went on to make several claims, including Munchausen's by proxy, even though the correct diagnosis was in place from the beginning, to Child Protective Services. Luckily, the CPS caseworker was extremely thorough and fully investigated the illness. The Peds ID doctor, out of frustration, asked me to bring my daughters to be evaluated by another doctor who had experience with adolescents with CFS. After a very thorough evaluation, he said they had what he called classic CFS and said he would get the school to provide full-time home tutoring. Instead of providing a written plan to start the tutors, the school made more CPS complaints. We signed our daughters out of school under threat of continuing CPS complaints and started them on an online program that they could start from the beginning and move at their own pace. We made a complaint of harassment and bullying to the superintendent, but it was ignored. Except for the fact that I filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights, I am certain that my daughter's school district would continue to refuse them an education and they would have no future because of the myth that is CFS. As it is, OCR accepted the school's excuses for bullying and harassing my daughters because the district claimed that they believed that I was doing harm to my daughters since they did not believe the doctor's description of illness. After we signed our daughters out of school, we brought them to a CFS specialist. He was the very first person to fully explain the symptoms of an illness that matched my daughters. He did additional medical testing to pinpoint physical abnormalities and started the girls in a treatment regimen. The science is there. It's just mixed up. In my opinion, the CDC should establish guidelines for pediatric specialists, school districts, and child protective investigators to help them to understand this illness. There is a real, there is a real illness which has been historically described and which still occurs in men and women, children and adults, whose symptoms still fit those described in the past. Current medical research supports the fact that groups of people diagnosed with CFS have real physical abnormalities, and yet most people believe the myth that anyone with a diagnosis of CFS just needs therapy. The name CFS and the description of the diagnosis are just plain damaging in my experience. They are used to mock, harass, and humiliate patients, some of whom are too young to defend themselves. It has been several years since the pediatric MECFS, the Canadian, and the international criteria have all been published. Why aren't they in use? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Alexander Mahano. I've been tagged. Alexander asked me to read his comments because life is so draining and being here is draining. Greetings to each of you, and welcome to the new CIFSAC committee members. Yay, live stream. We're glad you listened to us. Watching the CIFSAC via live stream, webcasting, whatever the term, helps people with MECFS who are unable to attend the CIFSAC participate in and be part of the CIFSAC meetings. Please note, many patients have altered wake sleep cycles, quite variable health, and are severely disabled, meaning there's no guarantee they can be awake enough or well enough to give public comment by phone. Participation via DVD or webcam, like the option to participate in the CIFSAC via live stream, makes the meeting more accessible to patients and enables patients who often live in isolation to be part of the CIFSAC meetings. Providing public comment via DVD or webcam is a very reasonable option and is one that is inclusive for
for a very disabled population. In October of 2008, the CIFSAC made the following recommendation. CIFSAC recogni recognizes that much can be done to ensure that every child with CFS has the best possible access to support and treatment, and asks that the Secretary facilitate a task force or working group to establish an ongoing interagency and inter interdepartmental effort to coordinate school, family, financial, and health care support for children and young adults with CFS. We are still waiting for this task force. Therefore, the CIFSAC charter must be strengthened to recognize that the CIFSAC committee members are the designated DHHS experts on MECFS. Recommendations of the CIFSAC, like the one above, must be treated as recommendations made by experts and acted upon accordingly and diligently. I have read and I endorse the joint letter of concern. I endorse the proposal that the CDC op adopt the IACFS ME primer as its new baseline and collaborate with international MECFS experts and patient organizations to refine it where needed and to proactively educate the medical community. I want it on record, though, that I have serious concerns about the title of the IACFSME's new subscription-based peer-reviewed journal titled Fatigue, Biomedicine, Health, and Behavior. The title of this new journal does not give warm, fuzzy feelings. Instead, because of its association with the IACFSME, it perpetuates the notion that this illness is a result of behavior and that changing behavior will make one well again. Would that it were that easy. If it had been that easy, more than a million Americans would be back to a full life because, believe me, we have tried changing our behavior and we didn't get well. Instead, MECFS remains imposed on my life and theirs without anyone's invitation. I want to be living my life to the fullest, studying, spending time with friends, working, being an independent adult. The points in the joint letter of concern must be enacted to get me there. The Department of Health and Human Services must undertake a strategic, coordinated, and fully funded effort to address the critical priorities for adequate MECFS research, treatment, and provider education. The MECFS strategic plan must be a coordinated and fully funded effort to finally solve MECFS. Additionally, the MECFS strategic plan must resolve the definition, name, and classification confusion, provide a fair share of research funding, focused on biological pathologies, biomarkers, and treatments, educate the medical community, accelerate the FDA pipeline for MECFS. Some of these are quotes from the letter of concern. The MECFS strategic plan must result in easily accessible treatments that enable patients, caregivers, medical professionals, and everyone else improve the quality of lives of patients while decreasing disability and sickness. I think you've heard that phrase before. The MECFS strategic plan must start now because, as I said last November at the CIFSEC meeting, I want my life back and so does my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Dickey. Uh, good morning. My name is Rob Dickey, and I'm Senior Vice President at Hemispherics Biopharma. I would like to update you today on two items, uh, but first I'll say that I'm, I'm going to go through in order to meet the time requirements uh, today in uh, a more expedited fashion than what you will find in my testimony that will be available on the CIFSAC uh, website. And in addition, there's several publications that I'm going to mention that we have copies of here today if anyone would like to. Uh, to, to see those. We can hand those out. Um, the two items I'd like to update you on, the first is an analysis out of Harvard and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, on the economic cost of CFS. And the second is just published data on hemispherics phase three study in C CFS with our investigational compound, Amplogen. The U.S. government estimates that as many as four million adults in the U.S suffer from CFS. This is roughly equivalent to the prevalence of Alzheimer's and 10 times larger than that of multiple sclerosis, a condition with similar functional impairment, also of unknown etiology, but with more than five FDA-approved 
therapies. Presently, there is no approved therapy for CFS. CFS occurs in all ethnic groups and races and in countries around the world. It most often occurs in people aged 40 to 59, and women are three times or so more likely than men to develop it. Published data have estimated that 14.3 percent of CFS sufferers have severe disease. Such patients are house-ridden, bedridden, and when ambulatory, may need to be in a wheelchair. The more severely ill patients die prematurely, often from organ failure, cancer, and heart disease or suicide. Last year, the CDC and Harvard published an analysis where they calculated the economic burden for a CFS sufferer to be $11,780 per year per person. If it was assumed that the CFS patient population that was currently under care was one million, then the annual cost to society would be $11.8 billion. Assuming four million CFS sufferers, it would be $47.1 billion per year. Amplogen is a synthetic immunomodulatory double-stranded RNA compound that activates innate immunity and is a highly selective toll-like receptor 3, a TLR3 activator. Amplogen meets the definition of a new molecular entity. Amplogen has completed phase 1, phase 2, and phase 3 clinical studies, but is yet to be approved for commercial sale. It should be noted that the mechanism of action of Amplogen as a TLR3 activator is shared in part with that of a TLR4 activator, which has been approved as a component of an HPV vaccine. <laughs> Amplogen has been administered to more than 800 patients with 90,000 injections. Over 200 patients have received Amplogen for one or two years or longer. There is no indication of a specific adverse event that appears after long-term Amplogen administration. No evidence of dose-limiting organ toxicity has been observed, including hematologic, liver, or renal toxicity. Transitory side effects, when seen, usually occur during the initial weeks of treatment and tend to subside on, admitted, on repeated administration. In addition to these clinical studies, Hemispherics has been conducting a treatment protocol since 1997. We have published data showing that patients on Amplogen reduced their use of concomitant medications. In particular, there was a reduction in medications which prolonged the QT interval. Prolongation of the QT interval is a risk factor for sudden cardiac death and arrhythmias and is associated with certain drugs often used by CFS sufferers. In mid-March, data was published on our AMP 516 Phase 3 clinical trial. The study involved 234 severely depilated patients at 12 clinical sites. The primary endpoint of study was exercise tolerance, an endpoint that has been used to approve numerous drugs. One minute. The improvement in exercise tolerance over placebo with those approved drugs on an intra-treatment group basis ranged from 4.1 to 10.6 percent. In our study, the hemispheric study, those patients on Amplogen had an improvement of 14 percent, and for the intent to treat population, the improvement was 11.8 percent. On an intra-patient basis, patients on Amplogen improved an average of 21 percent over placebo. In another analysis, the proportion of patients with exercise improvement of at least 25 percent and at least 50 percent were respectively 1.7 and 1.9 fold greater for the Amplogen group. Further, an at a post hoc continuous responder analysis, which looked at response levels from 25 to 50 percent in 5 percent in increments, showed a significantly greater improvement for patients receiving Amplogen. It is our understanding that the SCFS patient community is seeking a stakeholder meeting with the FDA. As the sponsor of the most advanced experimental treatment for CFS, Hemispherics would be willing to participate should such a meeting take place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Charlotte Bowen. Hello, Charlotte could not be here today. She asked me to read for her. My name is Charlotte. I have been sick with CFIDS for 13 of 26 years. I'm not the only one in my family, as my father also has CFIDS and has been sick for 27 of 52 years. 
His name is Brett. It's something of a perverse anniversary of being sick when at this moment, for both of us, half of our lives have been taken from us by this vicious, overbearing, torturous, relentless, unforgiving, graceless, demanding, sadistic chimera disease. What challenges with work, school, families, friends have I faced because of CFIDS? Can't move out of my parents' house. I had to drop out of college for five years. And though I've been able to go back, I can only endure one or two classes, and I have to fight and struggle through brain fog, pain, etc., to meet deadlines and such, often making myself sicker. This fight is made worse by the physical activity required to be on campus, trekking between classes and the energy necessary to get to and from the campus. While online classes are more friendly in the physical aspect, they still possess the same hurtling challenges. I have no dating life, barely a social life. My friends are very few. Most of my relatives are annoyed, distant, and disinterested. There is no way to truly predict exactly when and how long I will be able to do something consistently before I must quit, or how one thing, regardless of size and significance, will tip the scales and what the repercussions will be. If energy were money, my allowance slash paycheck would be a handful of nickels and dimes that I must budget each day with the constant awareness that without notice, something big and expensive will come along that I can't avoid and must pay for, regardless if I'm in the black or in the red. How has CFIDS impacted my life? I've had to downgrade my expectations for my life. The dreams and aspirations from the yesterdays when I was healthy are now a galaxy beyond my reach in the times of today. As for the tomorrows, I must constantly keep myself in check to keep myself from dreaming too big and then falling flat on my face because I couldn't reach the expectations and goals that I had set. I've had to learn when the shit hits the fan, pardon the language, and I'm experiencing a bad day that I had to put everything on pause like some game until my battery recharges and then pick up where I left off, always aware of the low charge and that sooner or later, or even without notice, I must once again pause the game and let the bad battery charge up as much as it can. When I watch those who are near my age run off to many social activities and leave me behind, and who live such lively and exciting lives, who have college degrees, who have families, who have careers, I feel so lonely and ostracized. Because my face isn't often seen, I'm easily overlooked and forgotten. What must be done to ensure that people do understand about CFIDS? What can be readily changed about that, and how do we move forward toward that change? When I was diagnosed, the small amount of knowledge that had accumulated since my father was diagnosed had given me a slightly lighter sentence, if you will, than his, as he is nearly bedbound and must rely on opiates to take the edge off of the severe pain he experiences. Those of us who are able to go out in society, even to, in the slightest degree, are too quickly misunderstood and believed to be liars looking for handouts. CFIDS isn't seen as readily as cancer. It isn't seen as readily as autism. It isn't seen as readily as diabetes. CFIDS is not being advertised to make the public aware like fibromyalgia and shingles. Even though CFIDS is becoming increasingly more prevalent, there aren't enough people out there who accept its existence, and therefore so many people suffer unnecessarily with CFIDS. People also need to understand that CFIDS is a dynamic disease. While symptoms can fade and disappear, they can also fester or become something new. The remedies and therapies that work today to help alleviate those symptoms are not guaranteed to work as effectively or at all tomorrow or the day after or the week after that. YouTube isn't enough publicity. Widespread dissemination of accurate information will greatly benefit us all. One minute. The costs of treatments will decline as diagnoses come sooner, therapies be begin sooner, and the quality of life will be increased and maintained. More money, time and effort needs to be put into understanding this bitch of a disease. To make CFIDS more acceptable overall, more money, time, and effort needs to be put into increasing awareness. The more knowledgeable people are, especially doctors, specialists, and caregivers, the more money, time, and effort will be put into research and subsequently better treatments and diagnoses. Thank you. Thank you. This one I'm going to call. It's uh, Susan Kreutzer. Ms. 
right, sir? Yes. Yes, hi. This is Dr. Nancy Lee. Um, are you ready to speak uh, for, yes. for your public comment? Good. Um, I think you're on the speaker. Okay, go for it. My name is Susan Kreitzer. I have requested the opportunity to speak today to express my continuing concerns with how the United States government is coordinating investigations, research, and public dissemination of information related to the illness identified as ME-CFS. I am a patient with this illness, and I have personally experienced the systems in place to assist people with this illness in both receiving an adequate diagnosis, treatment, public services, and public information. My experiences have been shocking to me. I believe there's a wholly inadequate, I believe that these have been wholly inadequate and shameful as it relates to how resources and information are provided by the U.S. government to individuals who have been afflicted by this complex and devastating illness. I can provide specific examples of my personal experiences with medical professionals and institutions, disability insurers, Social Security Administration, and other third parties charged with assisting in research, investigation, and dissemination of information about this illness. I am fairly new to the CFS world, but in the very short time I have come to understand the history of this illness and the lack of progress that has been made for over 25 years to investigate, understand, and provide adequate support to individuals affected by this illness. I am saddened, angered, and disheartened that this is the best that the U.S. government can do to help a large group of disabled U.S. citizens. Please note that my criticism is directed toward the highest levels of our government, not at those individuals employed by the U.S. government who have worked diligently to try to affect change to the public understanding of this illness and the resources that can be effectively marshaled to provide adequate help for this illness. I realize that the time that can be allocated to any one individual giving public testimony before this committee is limited. Therefore, I'm requesting that the highest ranking government officials in every agency which this illness touches be charged to give this illness the highest priority to coordinate a plan of action. In my opinion, the plans put together over the last 25 years by this government have not been sufficient to bring about the needed changes and dissemination of information that is needed across multiple levels of our government. President Obama made a promise to a patient last year in a press interview that he would look into this illness and try to get the help that people with this illness needed. Mr. President and Secretary Sebelius, of the National Institutes of Health. I am urging and begging you to follow through on this promise. President Obama, you are the ultimate person in charge of all the agencies who have some impact with this illness. And without your active help and oversight of what has gone in the past with this illness, the present and the future, I fear no substantial plan to help us will ever be implemented. I also fear that a significant portion of U.S. citizens and patients around the world will not receive the care, attention, and resources that this illness so badly deserves. I apologize for any errors I've made in my written or oral testimony. I am trying to communicate in a very short time frame with cognitive neurological deficits resulting from this illness. I am available at any time if you or any person who is charged with responsibility with overseeing this illness on behalf of the United States government would like to speak to me or my family to obtain additional information regarding my concerns, experiences, and suggestions for how a plan could be implemented to afford positive changes in the government's response to this illness. I thank you for giving me the time to speak publicly about my concerns. I have a background in insurance. I once was a lawyer and I've worked for the government. 
I do have background that I believe could help facilitate moving this illness and the help that the government can give us forward. And I thank those who have helped me. I thank you, Dr. Kolganek, and Open Medicine Institute, and I thank Stacy Stevens, who today I'm undergoing testing with the Pacific Fatigue Labs. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Dimmick. Oh, yeah. Mary Dimmick? Good morning. Thank you for giving me the time to talk today. I am reading this letter on behalf of 14 MECFS patient organizations and 19 MECFS patient advocates. The full letter is in your binders. It's been submitted to, Dr. to Secretary Sebelius and Dr. Koh, and it will be posted online. Dear Secretary Sebelius, Dr. Koh, Dr. Lee, and CIFSAC members, we strongly believe there is an urgent need for the Department of Health and Human Services to undertake a strategic, coordinated, and fully funded effort to address the critical priorities for adequate MECFS research, treatment, and provider education. Therefore, we respectfully request a meeting to discuss the concerns raised in this letter and to begin formulating a comprehensive plan to address those concerns. For more than 25 years, DHHS has known about the devastating impact of MECFS, a disease that the CDC has said can be as disabling as multiple sclerosis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, heart disease, end-stage renal disease, and other similar chronic conditions. MECFS has obliterated the lives of more than one million patients. Patients can be sick for decades, often homebound and bedridden and more likely to die prematurely from cancer, heart failure, or suicide. Former CIFSAC member Dr. Nancy Klimas stated, my HIV patients for the most part are hale and hearty thanks to three decades of intense and an excellent research and billions of dollars invested. Many of my CFS patients, on the other hand, are terribly ill and unable to work or participate in the care of their families. Compounding the personal devastation is the effect on our country's economic well-being. MECFS drains our workforce and costs our country an estimated 18 to $23 billion a year. In spite of all of this, very little has been done for 25 years. The problems are clear. Confusion around the definition. Paltry and misapplied NIH funding inadequate physician education, and an FDA pipeline that has failed to deliver any real treatments. We do acknowledge some progress has been made and we appreciate it, but for patients who have been sick for 25 years, it's all too little and it's too slow. We need a significant, sustained, and coordinated commitment by DHHS, across DHHS, to address the following four key priorities. Resolve the confusion around the definition, name, and classification. Provide a fair share of research funding and ensure it is focused on biological pathologies, biomarkers, and real treatments. Educate the medical community so patients can get appropriate care. Accelerate the FDA pipeline to deliver desperately needed treatments. While there are other priorities, these four are the most critical today, and they have been for the last 25 years. Many of us have lost decades of our lives from this lack of progress. We cannot allow our lives to be destroyed any longer. Our country cannot afford the economic cost. It is time for the United States government to embrace this disease with the seriousness, urgency, and vigor that has characterized the fight against HIV AIDS. We urge DHHS to convene a meeting between MECFSH patient representatives and key representatives from across DHHS to discuss the concerns raised in this letter and to begin to formulate a strategic, coordinated, and fully funded plan to address the challenge. We ask for a reply from Secretary Sebelius by August 1, 2012. This letter was signed by the following organizations, CFS Solutions of West Michigan, CFS Knowledge Center, CFS Fibromyalgia Organization of Georgia, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Fibromyalgia, and Chemical Sensitivity Coalition of Chicago, 
Coalition for ME-CFS, the Connecticut CFIDS and FM Association, the Massachusetts CFIDS and F Association, New Jersey CFS Association, Pandora, Phoenix Rising, Rocky Mountain CFS and F M Association, Speak Up About ME, Vermont CFIDS Association, Wisconsin ME-CFS Association. It was also signed by the following advocates. Lori Chapo Kroger, Dr. Lily Chu, Lori Decker, Mary Dimmick, Pat Ferro, Susan Jackson, Court Johnson, Patricia Lo Rosa, Denise Lopez Mahano, Robert Miller, Mike Manaz, Donna Pearson, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, Megan Shannon, Rivka Solomon, Jennifer Spatilla, Nancy Vasaki, Toby Vacala, Charlotte Gonzalez, and finally Matina Nil Nic Nicholson, whose name was inadvertently omitted from the letter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laurie Chapel Kroger will be uh, providing, uh, will reading some anonymous uh, testimony. Thank you, Laurie. Yes. This was written by a mother, um, and she wrote it for all mothers out there and grandmothers who are afraid that their children or grandchildren have um, chronic fatigue syndrome. I have had ME for 19 years, and I know the devastation it brings patients' lives. My demand today is that you stop for a minute and realize what coming down with ME can mean for young people. Then imagine you are me, a parent, with a 14-year-old son who suddenly needs far more than his usual sleep and complains of being so tired all the time. Can you imagine? Can you feel my fear? Pretend it's you, and you have ME, and this is your child. What do you do? You don't want to scare him to death and tell him you're afraid he might be coming down with it. You might tell him you want him to have a good checkup, but wait, it took three doctors before you knew what you have. So what do you do? Then you remember, there's no diagnostic marker, there's no simple blood test. Well, you say to yourself, maybe he has mono. I can ask the doctor about that. And then you remember all the hundreds, if not thousands, of young people that never got over their mono. Feel the fear, feel the sense of helplessness. You ask yourself, do I just wait to see more symptoms? See if the circadian rhythms get turned upside down. Wait to see if he has lost lots of sore throats, and he does. Headaches, if he can't think as clearly, speak as well. Or for serious um, GI problems, he may never tell me about. Then you tell yourself that you're just imagining things, that your child is just fine, and he's going to have a school physical over the summer. And if he's still so tired after normal activity, you'll mention it to the doctor then. You tell yourself, well, he's an adolescent now. They do sleep a lot more, and there are lots of changes going on in that body. And that's probably all that's wrong. But you still have the fear, because you know there is no diagnostic marker. There is no simple blood test. You know because you have ME that there has not been sufficient funding to find the markers to have the simple blood test. You know that most doctors know about CFS, but not ME, that they can read the CDC website and check off the symptom list, and if they can find no other reason, they can diagnose me. Can you feel the fear? You know there's no simple treatment. There have been no clinical tri trials to get these kids well, that the CDC has not done their job for 25 years and have not invested in appropriate study that they would by now have answers as to treatment. Do you feel the fear? And a child shall lead them, the Bible says. No test equal no hope equal no help. Thank you. Anonymous. Thank you very much for reading that. We have time for, uh, we're moving at this point down our wait list. And so uh, 
if Matina Nicholson would like to uh, provide her testimony now. We'd appreciate it. I know this is last minute. Fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. It has been over four or five years. Can't remember um, how long I had it because of this disease. I'm too tired to look for history since I was diagnosed with ME-CFS, including additional two years of being undiagnosed and passed around to doctors, doctors, many who yelled at me, sent me to see a psychologist, ridiculed everything you already heard. It is a horrid disease that I would not wish on my worst enemy. I feel like I'm living a slow, torturous death, and I know that what a torturous death firsthand from helping take care of my friend's daughter, Rachel. She was eight years old, um, diagnosed with incurable brain cancer, and I stayed every step of the day for one year, and she just passed away March 12th. She um, taught me how to live with ME-CFS. She's my inspiration. Um, she taught me how to positively play hard and never, ever give up. Nugu, that's my saying. I had a hard time keeping up with her and caring for her and why she had a cancer, four brain surgeries. I was always sleeping. At the last three months, I finally could have the stamina that she was, which was sleeping and just holding her hand. She died as I put my hand on her hand um, quietly. Um, since her death, I decided to become an advocate to raise awareness, and we need to make a difference and get rid of these controversies, issues, and stigma that has afflicted many patients for too many years. I'll be meeting with government officials and agencies as much as possible as a collaborative group. For everyone on this committee, except for the MECF experts, this has made me sick and mostly bedbound for a couple of months. However, I'm not going to let this stand by. I'd rather be sick in bed than get up and fight for what's right for us so I can, everyone can have a normal life, especially children and teenagers who need to finish school have a life. Um, it's time to focus on the much-needed solutions that have been um, stated over and over in an urgent man manner. Resolve the definition, name, and classification confusion. Provide a fair share of research funding focused on biological pathologies, biomarkers, and treatments. Focus on research on MECFS patients, and if you do, if they have comorbidities, make sure that um, you provide analysis and conclusions on each of the comorbidities. Comor Abandon the psychological research. Most of us are not depressed. We are beyond frustrated. Educate the medical public community, not just seeing me on Netscape or YouTube. Update the CDC website um, and make it accurate. And why not do a national public service announcement like you're currently doing for the anti-smoking campaign by the CDC? Work with patient advocacy groups and patient advocates on a quarterly basis. Uh, make sure all your government meetings um, include all groups and advocates um, so we have a collaborative effort because if you meet with us le um, separately, it's still going to delay the progress of uh, we are trying to do for 25 years. Uh, let's stop the nonsense, the blame game, and start fresh and resolve the issues. We want our lives back. We would you like to spend the next 20 years mostly in your bed? Almost 24-7 have extreme fatigue where you can hardly get up without medication. It takes me about two hours just to reach for my pills to get up, and that's why I was late today. IBS, fibroadro, myalgia, cognitive abilities, just get sick by talking. After hours, I'll start stuttering. I can't think. I can't do daily chores. Sense of the smell and noise. Can't drive at night, and all 40 other. But you can't see it. I don't look sick, but in my body, it's torture. What would you do if, um, if you had a disease out of a loved one or a child? I highly believe you would do the same thing if all of us here. Demand an accurate name, um, because as you can see, as history, it's not fatigue, and um, it's not a joke, and everyone dismiss dismisses it. You would want to be treated with dig dignity by physicians, and, um, and collaborate, not talking to this MECF experts who are awesome. And um, you want to, your physician to know how to treat you or refer you to the specialist. You want your government to make this an urgent matter and provide you adequate funding, not six million. You would be just like me, very frustrating, wondering how can a disease with over 25 years of issues and controversies happen in the United States. Therefore, I'm requesting a more open dialogue with the CDC, NIH, and CIFSAC to go through the recommendations from July 2011, explain the rationale for the no, and not just respond by email to me saying no. Um, no is no, essentially. I, did, I thought we didn't live in a dictatorship. Um, we have suffered too much. I think we need to work together and win-win for all. Um, we need fast solutions. Why? To save our sanity and to save the government billions of dollars. Thank you for all your efforts and support. My last com 
comments in honor of Rachel, to all who have enemy CFS, never ever give up, Nagu, let's unite, work together as a united front to make sure we get fairly treated and the stigma of enemy CFS is squashed. And to CIFSAC, CDC, and NNAH, let's work together and develop a cost-effective, innovative, innovative landmark model to resolve complex illnesses such as enemy CFS, to currently be known as true leaders that can change millions of people's lives and provide you greater success in your careers, careers than you already have. You have the power to make these changes. We don't. To all the MECFS experts, physician, and advocacy group, thank you so much for your treat and compassion and care and support for all of us. If we did not have all of you, our lives would be unmanageable and devastated. Thank you so much. So that uh, come, we come to the end of the first period of public comment. Um, it's now time to go uh, have a break for lunch. And um, we'll return promptly at 1.15 and begin our second panel that's covering the topic of uh, childhood CFS, ME. It is uh, a panel of, of children or ad adolescents with CFS and their caregivers.